This content is brought to you by Link2, which makes private equity investment easy. I've been a user of Link2 for years. They allow you to access many different tech companies and crypto companies pre-IPO. They have over 166,000 members. They have over $234 million in total investments. And some of the companies in their portfolio includes Ripple, Uphold, Circle, Dapper Labs, Ledger, BitPay, and many more. Link2 is one of the reputable companies out there working with some very big names. And if you'd like to learn more, please visit the link in the description. Welcome back to the Thinking Crypto Podcast, your home for cryptocurrency news and interviews. With me today is attorney Fred Rispoli, who is the founder of Hoddle Law. Fred, what a great day. Great to have you on. Now, oh, it is a good day to be an XRP supporter. What a great ruling we got from the court today. So many good things are happening for uh, XRP. Probably not a lot of good things for some other projects, but we'll get into it. XRP, yeah. baby! <laughs> Man, it's a long time coming. It was a painful, what is it, three years? Remember when the lawsuit got filed and uh, you know everybody... Was feeling to hurt the price crashed uh, a lot of confusion in the markets and this lawsuit is playing out lots of emotions so i'm on a high i'm feeling really happy but let's get into the details of the judge's ruling can you give us an overview of it sure there's a lot of things to pick through you know we'll get into it we'll get granular but the overall ruling takeaway a lot of people are probably familiar with it by now but there's certain baskets of Ripple sales that were evaluated. Some were investment contracts, others were not. So in the quote, institutional sales were deemed investment contracts as a matter of law. And there were some key things there, like that the level of sophistication, the marketing statements made by the company, all was able to give the court confidence in ruling institutional sales or investment contracts. The obviously biggest important factor for the retail holder is that programmatic sales are not investment contracts. You know, those were just blind sales that Ripple made to exchanges um, to kind of put out there to get the liquidity flowing. And that's most analogous to the secondary market um and you know by that the court did say in a footnote we're not talking about all secondary sales as a blanket matter which you know i and for a while now was not was kind of thinking that's where it was going to go to but she didn't what what i wish she went a little bit further with but didn't is that she specifically would have come out and said okay a lot of secondary sales are just not going to be securities, you know, because of the Amici and all these other examples. But she effectively did say that in a different way by saying programmatic sales were not because you've now got that guidepost and you just have to think, OK, everything that is less than what Ripple was doing in programmatic sales is probably going to be OK almost damn sure going to be okay. So that's, I, I sent out, uh, I was tweeting uh, JV, you know, because he had a good point on it is, you know, if, if programmatic sales aren't it, then of course, almost all secondary sales aren't going to be it, you know, so she was saying, basically, tell me secondary sales are in the clear without telling me they're in the clear. Mm -hmm. And then we've got this uh, other lump of other distributions that were also not investment contracts, gifts, grants, uh, compensation to employees. So all in all, a um, uh, extreme win for Ripple. There was definitely that hit on the institutional side, but you know, all the money they made in those institutional sales that are up for a fine uh, was more than covered in the two hours that happened since the ruling came out. For sure. And for years, I've been saying that most likely Ripple would have to pay a fine for early sales, maybe circa 2015 or so. So it seems like that's you know going to be part of it. They'll pay their fine and whatever it may be. But the important thing was XRP itself is a currency, not a security and secondary market sales, obviously not affected. 
Um, and, you know, as far as the outcomes and the next steps, what are the implications? Exchanges oh, can there relist. Are. Yeah, if you want to go through that. There's a ton. And thanks for pointing that out. I, I probably did not just say the most important thing, which is the ruling where XRP itself is not a security. You know, again, she had to address that because that was a, a big affirmative defense from uh, from Ripple. And so, yeah, it, it's great that she did that. I think, let's see, where do we want to break it down? One, I think um, as an overview, this was a master class ruling and splitting the baby. You know, we all hate in the XRP community or strongly dislike the SEC and what they did here. And that's, you know, no one's going to change our minds on that. But the SEC does a lot of things outside of crypto. And so Judge Torres, you know, didn't completely savage them in every way, shape and form. And, you know, gave them a little bit of dignity in this ruling by giving them something with the institutional sales. I was always a little hesitant on how she was going to split the baby, but, you know, she figured out a way to do it. And, you know, that that's what happened. So the SEC got a little something that they can chew on. And then Ripple got, you know, most of the meat on the bone. Uh, so the SEC did get their win. And, and what's critical here that, you know, I think, um, I would I would caution greatly every other project out there is that there is a roadmap now of exactly what is per se an investment contract. And when you look at the institutional sales of um, of what of what the court ruled for institutional sales and, you know, we can go over that in a second. She, there's very specific reasoning as to what a lot of other projects do, the statements they make, the statements their executive makes, the way they market it on chat forums. I mean, all these things were listed in the court's order that is going to put every company right in the crosshairs of being able to get hit for institutional sales. Again, this is the second, uh, or this was Southern District of New York. It's in the Second Circuit. It's just one case, but it, it is hugely uh, monumental and influential in other in other cases so it's not good news for other projects mm. and is there anything the sec can appeal or is this like this is it there's there's no going back so to speak as far as xrp not uh, not a security oh uh, they can definitely appeal ripple can appeal the institutional sales ruling so all the appeals are completely on the table you know, now is where I would expect to see some type of settlement, you know, in the next month or so, uh, where everybody, you know, the rulings are pretty much done. It's, you know, they are what they are. And there's no real point to, for either side to spend a lot of time and resources with this, you know, Chris Larson, Brad Garlinghouse aspect of the trial. It's the only triable part left. Um, and, you know, we'll see uh, we'll see what kind of devil is in the details, because, you know, the SEC can threaten on their settlement side. We're going to go after the programmatic sales, get that overturned unless you pay us more money. And, you know, Ripple can say, no, we're going to appeal institutional sales and you're going to be done on everything. So we're going to pay you less money. So now it's kind of where you know, the rubber meets the road, who's going to do what in terms of an appeal. I, I think it's a 60 day timeline from when the judgment's ordered. So there's no judgment yet. So there's no timeline ticking for the appeal. Um, but, you know, they'll have 60 days after that and we'll see what kind of negotiating they do on the sides. So with that said, um, can exchanges without hesitation go ahead and relist XRP or is there any layer of caution they have to take given that, you know, what you just said. Uh, so if I was the attorney uh, on all these exchanges, I would say, you know, relist immediately, mm. you know, provided we have some type of mechanism to actually have the XRP and, you know, have that market going. Um, but, you know, you could say if you were extremely timid, afraid of the government, 
you know, very scared as to making an actual statement or not, you could say, no, we're not going to list until the final judgment comes out until we see if they're going to find a notice of appeal, um, you know, because everything could be reversed at the second court. Um, I mean, it could go in all different directions at the second court. However, the law at now, uh, the law of the land with XRP is that it is not inherently a security programmatic sales from the company to uh, exchanges, third parties are not investment contracts. So an exchange just facilitating others uh, exchanging, buying, selling XRP is completely fine under this ruling. So you have absolutely no qualms with, you know, having the SEC come after you. Well, I mean, the SEC can still come after you for anything because they can come after you in bad faith. I mean, there's sure. there's nothing that prevents them from following the law and actually adhering to it. You know, I, I don't think they'd get very far in court, but nothing prevents them from hassling you or looking at your company cracking and maybe delaying the IPO or, you know, doing all that kind of stuff. So there's still, you know, all their weasel tactics that, that are there. Uh, but any exchange... Any council there has absolute can can relist or list with absolute confidence that it's fine under the provisions of the summary judgment order. You know, it's just what level of backbone do they have? Mm. Um, and, and I'm very curious to see what some of these exchanges do, especially like Coinbase. Um, so, you know, with regards to institutional sales, and I don't know if we have all the details yet on this. But let's say Bank of America uh, makes an announcement. We're partnering with Ripple, and then they want to buy some XRP to use for whatever, right? Uh, with payments and whatever it is, w would they have an issue, uh, or is it? Is there a certain way to go about doing it that they wouldn't have issues with the SEC? And given the ruling, yeah. So you know the the scary thing for like a bank of america is we don't want to be in the institutional sales mm. right now uh, or you know there's some other aspects of i mean this would take time but there are other aspects where ripple could now register xrp that it sells to these big time institutions who then would not have that same responsibility if they start using it, you know, in ODL, in cross-border transactions, or, you know, creating their own kind of secondary market. So, you know, a real easy way would be just to register those sales mm -hmm. um, without even have to worry about anything. The next thing you could do is kind of really pick through the way the judge ruled on it on institutional sales and make sure that you kind of get yourself out of it, or at least enough where it would make the SEC or anybody think twice about trying to throw you into that category. Um, so let's see, and I'm just kind of going through the order here a little bit. You know, the, the court did say, hey, when I'm looking at institutional buyers, they are sophisticated. You know, they've got the means and ability to know what what Ripple is trying to do. So most of the institutions will fit into that sophisticated, uh, sophisticated category. So that's a negative. Um, but if you kind of pull back from some of the agreements that Ripple had in the early days, uh, you know, like with the, let's see, they had a, something called a deep dive brochure that the court said was a factor. They had uh, David Schwartz got tagged a lot in, in this ruling for a lot of comments he said that the court relied on. Uh, and not just him, but, you know, there were some comments from from Chris and Brad, too, that the court uh, dwelled upon. Um, but, yeah, David got hit a lot. Uh, is that if they reduce the messaging in their sales contract? Oh, here, here's a, here's a, uh, a key point. The judge said, quote, in their sales contract, some institutional buyers agreed to lock up provisions or resale restrictions based on XRP's trading volume. 
a little bit further down, a rational economic actor would not agree to freeze millions of dollars if the purchaser's intent was to obtain a substitute for fiat currency. So it would be removing those types of provisions where you could do a direct sale, but you take away the lockup. You very clearly say, listen, you know, really, you could just also get this off the market, but we have a lot. So we're able to give it to you now, you know, as liquidity issues. There's all sorts of things you could, you know, nothing is going to give you a clear shot based on the way this ruling is. Well, not nothing, but if you're doing an institutional sale, the more you get away from lockups, indemnification, um, sale restrictions, the closer you're going to be to a programmatic sale, the way it's defined, and you'll be in the clear. Hmm. And I wonder if a possible solution, even though the SEC has tried to say that lending and borrowing is a security itself, they, they could lend XRP out to these exchanges, let them use it to make their money in the market or whatever it is, and then let you know give it back i don't know if how that works but that maybe that's a solution as well yeah so that would be an agreement you know that could be a t an agreement like ripple and we're really talking on the fly here yeah, but yeah. that could be something <laughs> like ripple has an almost open source lend if that that's not really the right term but an open source lending agreement where you know, the institution could come in, lend it out and have that ability. And since it's not very specific to any one institution, it could go more into that programmatic category. You know, I, I think you could you could work with something like that on on the edges. Um, now, could the rest of the crypto industry and altcoin projects, many who were named like in the Binance lawsuit, the Coinbase lawsuit, Cardano, Algorand and so forth, could they use any of this ruling and even Ripple's defense strategy to be able to fight it back against the SEC? It definitely, but it's going to go into a very fact-specific situation, which is what you know I've argued, a lot of the other lawyers have argued from the beginning, is that however this plays out, the SEC will take what they like and say, this is what the entire case is about. And I think maybe 20 minutes before we got on, uh, Ellie just okay. had a response from the SEC, which, you know, I think they're feeling a little butthurt right now because, <laughs> you know, you read their response and they're like, we want everything. Right. Uh, and to be fair, you know, Brad's response and Stuart Alderati's response was we basically want everything. Neither of those two are true. I do think that, or, or fully true, I do think that Ripple came out with the huge, huge win. Um, and then the biggest win overall was XRP holders. But the SEC has a lot of ammo in this institutional sales section from the court mm -hmm. to go after a lot of other, other crypto projects. Um, you know, anybody that's reading if they go to say page 19 through 21 of the order, you know, you read that and you could come up with a uh, hundred other different projects that did the exact same thing. And uh, it's Ethereum <clears throat> consensus that did the uh, exact same thing. And so the uh, court could totally, you know, get them on, or, or the SEC could totally go after them and uh, get them on all sorts of things that they go and say, this is just like the institutional sales that were investment contracts in the Ripple case, you know, we're coming after you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh <laughs> I was just thinking about like ETH, you know, and and the things we've discovered there. Where they did an ICO, you had a lot of whales buying XRP, uh, ETH, excuse me, um, and at a discounted rate. So I'm uh, uh, I'm curious what's going to happen to your point where the SEC has this language about institutional sales, or this Congress all of a sudden seeing this mess. And this is the, uh, you know, ultimate light at the end of the tunnel where they're like, oh, boy, this is a mess. We got to get fixed this. Patrick McHenry and Glenn Thompson's bill. To, I think yesterday, Lummis and Gillibrand introduced, reintroduced their bill as well. Uh, it's, it seems like Congress may have to step in here or this thing could get really messy. Yeah, I mean, the Congress can always come in and fix this problem. 
slash make it worse, you know, depending on what they do. You know, if Congress comes out with a bill tomorrow that says XRP itself is a security and any type of transaction in XRP is an investment contract, well, that just negates everything that happened going forward. It all negates all the good going forward, and that would be a terrible disaster. You know, they could also do the opposite and clarify everything, make it easier for other projects, give safe harbor provisions, clarify this is a unique technology that doesn't quite fit into completely the securities basket or the commodities basket. So that's why there's the new legislation. Congress can do all of those things. Is anything going to happen anytime soon? I don't think so. And now, you know, if I were Ripple, I wouldn't be, I would still be involved in my lobbying efforts, but I'm not putting my foot on the gas for any reason, because now I've got that clarity and nobody else has it or very few other actors have it. They have to still have the risk of saying they can feel better by saying everything that was good out of this ruling is how our company, our project, this token fits into it. But you don't have that full on guarantee of a signed summary judgment order that Ripple now has, you know, that XRP has. So that's why it's really bad for, in my opinion, I think this is very bad for every other project because it's got so much in the institutional section that is a big, big problem for most of the projects. Yeah, I, I remember Charles Hoskinson saying similar sentiments that are, uh, even if Ripple wins, it'll be bad for all the other projects in the in the market. Um, so right now you have Bitcoin that has clarity, XRP that has clarity, and Ethereum pseudo clarity because Gary Genser refuses to echo the statements of his predecessors, Jay Clayton and Bill Hinman. So I'm curious what the SEC is going to do with Ethereum, um, given uh, you know these developments, the Hinman emails, and then Gary Genser refusing to say anything about Ethereum. That's a great question. I do know a guy who's trying to get an answer on that and is suing the SEC right now about Ethereum. So we'll have to see how uh, his firm's lawsuit goes on that one. Auto Law, go ahead, check it out, everybody that's listening. Uh, we're, we're waiting, just a quick update. We're waiting for the judge to rule on the SEC's motion to dismiss. They, they don't want the judge to even answer the question, which is, is Ethereum a security or not? I'm trying to think right now if this is another good supplemental notice to send in to the, the court that, hey, this just came out in the Southern District of New York and is fairly relevant to what's happening here. We'll see. Now, I am just in a holding pattern on that case, you know, basically waiting on a answer the way we were all waiting for a long time on the Ripple summary judgment. But the lawsuits can start flying on there's nothing preventing them from flying in the first place we've seen the class action in the oakland ripple case where users are saying hey it was a security you know when we lost all our money during the last cycle or i forget maybe it was a 2017 cycle in that case so there's nothing that prevented it but now there's just another big arrow in the quiver uh, that you can use to say, this is just like an institutional sale mm -hmm. and you committed securities violations and now we're going after you. So there's still a lot of legal fighting to be done, but it is not over XRP. XRP ended up getting out of it and, and walking away free. Now, Going back to the Oakland case, there can still be some problems if that case comes out and the judge somehow, I don't see, I don't think this is a high probability, but the judge could rule or the jury could rule XRP itself is a security and by selling to the public, Ripple engaged in securities, unregistered securities transactions. Then we've got a split in the Northern District of California and the Southern District of New York, that's respectively the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals and the uh, Second Circuit Court of Appeals. 
And that could be a mess for a little bit. I mean, thinking that XRP in 11 states, I forget how many states are in the Ninth Circuit, but you know, in all of those states, it's uh, security. And in all of the other states in the Second Circuit, it's not. So it can still be a mess. But again, not to rain too much on everybody's happiness. It, it's a very positive situation. It's going to be very persuasive to other courts and other jurisdictions. We'll have to see how it plays out. But at least as of right now, companies, uh, users of certain tokens can have some degree of confidence. Well, XRP users have the most confidence. Others can have some degree of confidence if they're within what they think their token or project is that was cleared in the sense of Ripple XRP. Mm. Boy, I hope uh, that case in California doesn't go the direction you were talking about, because that that yeah, to your point could just make things really messy. Um, that's that's not going to happen. Anything there isn't going to happen for at least a year, maybe even two years. And if Ripple is smart, well, smart might not be the right word, but if I were Ripple, I might go to the plaintiff's attorney and say, listen, I get it. You got class certification. That's usually a huge hurdle that really increases settlement value in a class action lawsuit. I would go to the guy. I might wait a little bit to let things die down so I don't look desperate, but I would go to the plaintiff's attorneys there and say, listen, this is not good for you. This ruling uh, against the SEC we are going to win this case at trial. You know we're going to take it all the way to trial. You know we got the money. You know we just made almost $100 billion in the last three hours, right? Money is not really a concern to us. So how about this? Let's agree in this settlement, XRP, from they could just copy, paste what Judge Torres said in their settlement saying, yeah, 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 sure. This was a security in this situation well as i say that aloud okay i wouldn't agree to that i would draft the settlement agreement leaving some ambiguity we're not admitting any type of liability in any way shape or form sure. uh, but we are going to pay you a lot of money to distribute to anybody that's in the class this case is over and we're done hmm. uh see uh, that's great insight man <laughs> um and uh, most likely they'll 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 do that. I, I can imagine, or you you probably have to tweet it at them <laughs> or something. Yeah. So you know the the question there is if you're going to get you and I are part of that class if we want to sign up for it, and if we do sign, you know, would you sign up? No one's going to know if you Tony send in the little email to the plaintiff's attorney saying you're in the class. You want a little bit of that money that comes out in the settlement, but will you do it? Is the question. <laughs> no, I, I, I wouldn't because I, I didn't, I, I genuinely, when I entered the market, I didn't buy XRP because of Ripple. It was just, I learned about Bitcoin and Ethereum and I was just grabbing up as much as I can because I started believing in the tech and uh, yes, was I aware of Ripple? Yes, but I didn't know everything that they were doing. I was still new to the market, but I picked the top 10 or so where I started diversifying in that way. Um, so I don't feel like Ripple owes me anything or whatever it is. And I know after years of, of being in this asset class, a lot of the market moves of Bitcoin. <laughs> the, 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 doesn't matter what news comes out necessarily from Ripple or whoever else. If Bitcoin's pumping, the alts pull, the liquidity flows there with the market makers and the, the whales and so forth. Yeah, exactly. And I will say that I'm so thankful for this ruling that I wouldn't join the class, but I definitely would think about it and it would enter my head a little bit. And then I would say, you know what? Everything was so great. Everything turned out so well. Do the right thing, Fred, and just deny, <laughs> get knocked out. So you got there quicker than I did. Uh, we both got at the same place, but you know everybody else that's out there, you think about that. <laughs> um, so, Fred, um, I I know we touched on a lot. Is there anything else? Any other thoughts or comments on this situation as as we're still digesting it? Yeah, I, uh, well, I'm going to let my dog out of the house, out of the room. Sure. <laughs> She's tired of 
hearing me talk about XRP all day today and jumping <laughs> up and down and yelling and and being absolutely unbearable to anybody that doesn't know anything about XRP. <laughs> but but see, the you know, a couple of takeaways is the blue sky argument was not a winner for uh, Ripple. I thought it was an interesting run when they filed it. I saw where they were going, but the case law was pretty clear that you don't have to have a written contract, well, a contract, you know, whether written or indirect, you know, if you do enough action, you can create this investment contract. So they they've tossed it out there, but that was completely struck down. The, uh, let's see, what else was really interesting? There was a footnote, let's see, page 22, footnote 15, that the SEC had argued that Ripple sold investment contracts to the public and used institutional buyers as underwriters. The court, quote, rejects that argument. I thought, you know, that's tucked away in a footnote, but that's really helpful uh, for any type of project or coin or token to fit itself into that situation. So you don't have to worry about that underwriter argument that the SEC used. The programmatic buyer language was also really interesting because we've got language saying institutional buyer is sophisticated, programmatic buyer is not necessarily not sophisticated, but less sophisticated. So again, it's very interesting the way, and, and people have been commenting this on social media, that the VCs, the private equity companies could end up having a little bit of a difficulty here because all of that was investment contract, uh, that buying and selling, but the retail holder was not. So that's interesting. The, the court didn't even, the court specifically said on programmatic, we are not going to even evaluate the first two prongs of of Howie because there's just no um, the third prong wasn't met. So I'm not even going to we're not even going to get into that. So you can take that as good and bad in the fact that there's no good case law on it. There's no bad case law, but that's still an open question. So now. Even if the SEC threatens your company that or or anybody's project that, hey, you know, we think you meet this definition, you can still argue those first two prongs are still completely up in the air and undetermined, even if you've got an issue on this this investment side on the on the third prong. Um we, we did get the footnote. This is footnote 16 that. Uh, court does not address whether secondary market sales of XRP constitute offers and sales and investment contracts because that question is, quote, not properly before the court. So this is really important. And some people are out there saying, we told you she was never going to rule on secondary market sales. And I'm saying, hey, she basically did. Yeah. The the. I think I'm closer to being right, but you know, I'm not literally correct on that. But the thing is, is that we can create, you and I could come up with ways to sell XRP as a security, as an investment contract. There's definite ways we can come up with, with doing it. So it would be unfair and legally incorrect to say no secondary market sales could ever be investment contracts. So, and, and that's what I was saying the court was going to do is going to say, I'm not going to answer this in a hundred percent fashion. But I am going to say some secondary sales are not. And that's what the court did. Basically, through programmatic sales, that's a clear secondary component that is not going to be an investment contract. So what this leaves it is that with XRP, the SEC would have to go after, look at every single transaction and say, we got to figure out if this transaction was a securities violation. There's just no... It is impossible for do for them to do that on every single transaction. They just got to go for where they'll get the most bang for their buck. And so, oh, a lot of people are going to be in the clear with XRP. Probably a lot of people are going to be in the clear with other tokens as well, just back and forth trading. But it's not in stone as it is in XRP, but very close to being in stone. But there was, I think, and I would advise companies, there's a strong 
ruling on what secondary sales are and are not covered in this order. So you can you can be pretty confident on going forward from there. Brad, Brad, I just noticed a tweet. Coinbase said we will enable trading for XRP on the XRP network. <laughs> yeah. Oh, is that out. like hot off the presses a minute or two ago? <laughs> Literally like five minutes ago, they tweeted out. So that's big, man. I mean, that's the largest exchange in the US and I can imagine the other exchanges are going to follow suit. Yeah, that's the that's the next leg up in XRP price, in my opinion, is now when, when everything starts getting up. Because I, uh, I at 54 cents, I was trying to get into Uphold and dump a bunch of money into XRP <laughs> as my wife was sitting in the background saying, you already got enough, you already got enough. <laughs> and I'm like, it's never enough. And so, and I couldn't get it. I, I, I think I got a few transactions push through at 74 cents but you know you get to relive the whole mania of the last cycles if you've been involved in that time where just not having a transaction go through you've already lost 20 oh, percent yeah. of the gains from when you tried to get it through so i i tried to get let's see i got a few go through on uphold i could not get anything to go through on i couldn't even see that xrp was actually listed on iTrust when i tried to get it to go through there I don't know if you tried to go on on iTrust too, but when these other exchanges start listing it, it'll be a nice little uh, bump and run up there as well. And I'm glad they are. You know, I sent out that mean, maybe a little mean spirited tweet to everybody there, but that was because they never had to be in that situation where they delisted it in the first place. So. Yeah. I wanted to give them a little kick in the pants to get on top of this and let's get this done because you now have no reason, no legal reason why you can't rely on a granted Southern district court judge, but a Southern district court judge that was not in a civil lawsuit against two private parties, a company versus the securities and exchange commission finding her findings of fact and findings of law that's embodied in the summary judgment order, you can rely on that as legal counsel and say, we can relist this right now. And if we're going to be timid and scared, we only can, you know, that really only needs to kick in now if there's a notice of appeal filed and that starts going through the briefing. But even then, you can still say the law as it stands now is on our side. So now we don't have to wait until that second circuit court of appeals comes out mm. before we get scared and delist again. So there, there was no reason to have to delist ever. They did, but now there's certainly no solid reason not to relist now that this order's out. For sure. Fred, great stuff, man. I appreciate the insight. And, uh, I, I do. I do want to make sure. I also say this for you know folks who are going to list, uh, who are going to be listening and watching this. Look, the price is pumping. Um, just be careful because market cycles still play a factor here in charts and where things can get rejected and roll over. I'm not saying XRP is not going to higher price, but I, I see you know I don't want people to FOMO in. They're buying the top of this rally and then pff, you know. So <laughs> be careful, guys. Do your research. Yeah, exactly. I. Just 40 minutes ago, my wife was in that chair over there saying, do you remember when you said all this at the last bull market and you didn't sell and everything was going up sky high? And I will admit that I said, no, it's all different this time again, or it's going to be great. And that's wrong. That's wrong, everybody. It's probably not going to be different. So remember to take your profits yes. where you're comfortable taking them. I agree wholeheartedly with Tony that there's going to be some bumps, dips along the road. So be happy, but just remember to be smart at the same time. You don't even have to be fully smart, just a little bit smart. Take some profits. For sure. Awesome. Thank you so much, Fred. All right. Thanks for having me. See you next time.